Well, all eyes are on Morocco. I gotta be honest, I don't watch sports. Certainly don't watch uh, soccer, or I'm sorry, football. Uh, the only sport I watch is mixed martial arts or MMA, UFC, cage fighting. But even I couldn't help but watch all of the celebrations the, of Moroccan players dancing on the field with their mothers. This is just a beautiful sight to watch. And I had to ask, like, why are Muslims so excited about these images that are coming out or enthused about them? I think the reason is obvious. We get such negative press all the time. The media only can see us through a security lens. Either it's about terrorism, or even if it's quote unquote positive, it's Muslims fighting terrorism, or that is in the counter-terrorism lens. And so here I think to see Muslims in the light of sports and just being human beings, that was kind of beautiful. We were able to see that despite all of the negative coverage of Qatar prior to and leading up to the World Cup, really deeply Islamophobic media content, anti-Arab content as well. Watching these celebrations, it, it was awesome, to be honest. I want to share a Facebook post by Haris Thirin that really spoke to the moment. I got to be honest, I stole it and posted it on Twitter. Here's what he wrote, quote, What I love most about this Moroccan team is the love they have shown their mothers on the field. They are normalizing this joy and beauty of showing affection and care to their moms. It's beautiful and so refreshing to see on the international stage. So many caricatures of angry Muslim and Arab men have been normalized who don't show affection and love to women, who don't have joy and beauty. And this type of display shatters that narrative. I think it's ridiculous that people have this idea that Muslims or Arabs hate their women. Yes, they maybe follow traditional social customs, traditional roles which are considered patriarchal in the West, but that doesn't mean that they hate their women. Come on, be serious now. I think these celebrations show the love and respect uh, Muslims and Arabs show to their mother and to their parents in general. And this is actually an area where the West, secular West can learn from the Arab and Islamic world. It's not the case that the learning always has to be the other way around. That is, Arabs and Muslims having to learn from the more quote-unquote civilized Western world. Um, yes, there are things that the Muslim and Islamic world should and, uh, you know, try to learn from the West, but it's not always the case. You know, I was watching this debate between Daniel Hakikichu and Aaron Ra, who is the atheist, showed all of these lists of the best places in the world to live. And of course, most of them, or all of them, were white majority Western countries, of course. And Daniel Hakikichu responded, rightfully so, I mean, a broken clock is right twice, right a day, but he rightfully said, that these lists are prioritizing secular values. So of course, secular Western countries are gonna come out on top. That goes without saying. Now, I don't think it's the case that we can completely dismiss these lists because I do think Muslim and Arab countries should try to rise up on those lists. For example, when it comes to press freedom and other such factors or elements. Um, but I do think there are other lists that can be constructed in which Muslim and Arab countries would do very well on and secular Western countries would do poorly on. But for some reason, those lists are never created. We wonder why. Of course, it's because Westerners are the ones who are creating these lists to begin with. For example, I think if we were uh, trying to evaluate what some academics call social capital, I think Muslim and Arab countries would do very well and secular Western countries would not do so well. What do I mean by social capital? Social capital, it means what are a person's um, family and friends kind of network that they can call upon or use, especially in times of stress? So when it comes to the Muslim and Arab world, as well as traditional religious societies, they have very strong family units. And this is not just the nuclear family, but the extended family as well. There's a whole tribe that you can call on. And that's something that is a source of strength for Muslims and Arabs, people who come from traditional religious societies. And honestly, secular Westerners are you know, missing out when it comes to that. And they can learn from these traditional religious societies when it comes to this. So I'm a physician, I'm an ER doc, and I often see how weak the social networks are in the, in the Western world, how low or how little social capital they have. So often I'll see, you know, it's, it's not just a stereotype that you have all these old people in the West who are dying and in nursing homes where their family almost never visits them. There are people who die in old age in their houses. They live alone. Nobody even knows that they're dead until, you know, the neighbor notices a bad smell or the family after many days and weeks can't contact the family member. And then they'll come into my emergency room. And then when I call family, I mean, it's almost, I'm, I'm always kind of shocked, not always, but often shocked at how nonchalant the response is and how almost, you know, very few people come and even visit the dead. 
Meanwhile, if it's a Muslim or Arab who's sick or dying or, or dies, and it doesn't have to just be a Muslim or Arab, anybody who comes from a traditional religious society, you'll see a whole tribe that comes, you know, a veritable tribe. I'm not, I'm not literally saying a tribe, but a, you know, a huge group of people will come into the emergency room, into the hospital to visit, to give solace, to give uh, comfort to the family and the person who might be dying. And, you know, staff will often get annoyed at this, the ER staff. And I think it's because they're not used to this. They're not used to the fact that people have these strong networks. And so when they see it, they think it's just abnormal. You see the same kind of thing, by the way, when it comes to, you know, recently I've been traveling with my son. He's, you know, very young and people get annoyed on the plane that, oh my God, it's a kid. He's crying. He's a kid. Of course he's going to cry. But we've normalized this idea that, you know, you go to a restaurant and there are not supposed to be any young kids there. But if you go to other countries, for example, Pakistan, Turkey, you go to restaurants, there are going to be kids everywhere. They're celebrated and they're just taken. It's just taken for granted that there's going to be crying kids and screaming and yelling. And that's great. Um, but in the West, we're just not used to strong family life. And so we see this as abnormal. Scholars call this social atomization, where uh, in secular Western societies, People are becoming more and more isolated. They're basically, you know, living in cells. Uh, it's, one author called it, quote unquote, a human zoo, where you live alone in a small apartment. Um, you almost barely leave your apartment. You can order your food on your app. Um, you just spend all your time chatting online to non-real people. That is, you're not meeting them in real life. You may never not even know them in real life. You might be using an alter ego uh, a pseudonym um, to do it. This is the kind of life that happens in the secular West increasingly. And meanwhile, if you go into many Muslim or Arab countries or just in the Middle East in general, you'll go and you'll see the people are hanging out outside. They'll stay out late at night in groups of people. And there's this very strong bonding that happens, not just in the family unit, but even amongst friends. You know, coming back to sports. Uh, you know, I told you that I follow mixed martial arts, MMA or UFC, as it's, many people know it. Now there's been a rise of all of these Muslim champions. Uh, one of them retired recently, Khabib Nurmagomedov. I'm sure you've heard of him. Uh, but, but many Westerners were impressed by his relationship with his father. He had showed great respect and love to his father, who was also his coach. Now, this is not abnormal amongst fighters or boxers. They'll often Their fathers will often be their first coaches. But often what you see in the West is... Uh, as the fighter or boxer climbs in the ranks, gets more famous, more wealthy, there'll often be a split between son and father as the son kind of, um, you know, gets out of the father's shadow. There'll often be this break between them. But that wasn't the case with Khabib. Even as he rose up and became wealthy and famous, he remained humble. In fact, there was a very touching moment in which he wrapped the belt, not around himself, but around his father. Um, so these images, and that reminded me of what we're seeing in Morocco with those Moroccan soccer players where they're dancing with their mothers. They're grateful to their parents for getting them to where they are. And that is the traditional religious disposition where whenever you do any accomplish anything good, you always show gratefulness. You show gratefulness to God. So you'll always you'll often see fighters who are very religious. They'll first thank and praise God. The reason they do that is anytime you do anything good, you you're grateful and you show your gratefulness to someone else, first to God, then to your parents. Meanwhile, you can flip that around with kind of the secular mentality. And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily have to be a non-believer, but that secular mentality is where you grow in ego yourself. And it's the ana mentality, I, I, I. And you see this, for example, in Khabib's arch nemesis, Conor McGregor, when he rose up in the ranks, he really attributed it to himself. And you'll see this with a lot of CEOs and people who get rich and wealthy in the West. They always praise themselves that I worked up, I worked really hard, I raised myself up by my own bootstraps. Um, instead of showing this humbleness and gratefulness, um, which is a part of the traditional religious disposition. Definitely a part of Islam, but also other religions as well. So I think that's an aspect that's missing in the West and the secular West, and there's just this low social capital, that's a problem. And that's why, you know, I'm considered a reformist Muslim, and I do think that we need to, you know, rethink certain things in modernity. But one of the things that I don't think we should mess with is family, filial piety, showing 
uh, bonds, you know, maintaining bonds in the family. And that requires that we not only focus on rights. So the West, secular West is all focused on individual rights. And I think that's important. Autonomy, that stuff is important and has a, uh, and, and should be stressed. But there's also a reciprocal uh, relationship of duties. And so that's where the secular West is kind of lacking, to be honest. And the traditional religious disposition, disposition is important. You know, the Quran, for example, talks about duties to parents. The Bible talks about this as well. This is something that's missing in the secular West. And I think it's just refreshing to see. And I think many Westerners will look at that and see, hmm, maybe we're missing out on something. The other thing that we're seeing is that despite what Arab dictators may say or do, whatever treaties they kind of sign with Israel, we saw that the man on the street, Arabs on the street, they're not having any of it. Their loyalty and solidarity is still with the Palestinian people against secular colonial force that is uh, Israel. That's why I think sports are also important. You have what my boss calls people-to-people -people diplomacy, and that you see in sports. Bottom line is, uh, this is a moment of rejoicing and celebration as we see these images. I hope Morocco comes out on top, but we'll find out. Someone sent this to me after I'd already recorded the video, so I'm just going to read it out to you. It's, it's too good not to include. So, a German commentator talked about the scenes of Moroccan players hugging and kissing their parents and group prayers after each match. He said, quote, We no longer see the intimate family bonds in our Western societies. The concept of family is fading, and we can only see the players kissing their models and girlfriends while their parents are left in nursing homes. The moral support of the family played a big role in Morocco's wins. We taught them, means the Moroccans, how to play football, so they excelled and exceeded us. And we should learn ethics and family values from them, hoping one day we see our players kissing the forehead of their mothers and fathers too. And then it closes off with, with our moms we forget the world. A World Cup that showed the best of Arab Muslims and Islam. I think this is a beautiful way to sum up the entire situation. Thank you so much. Stay tuned for our next episode and make sure to like and subscribe and share. We're trying to grow this channel. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have suggestions for future topics, please let me know in the comments. I do read them. Thank you so much and see you next time.